Um, there are many countries in the world, um, sadly, still, where education is not an entitlement. It is not a right. And obviously we're seeing that um, in Afghanistan at the moment where girls are being denied the right to uh, an education. So, so this idea that uh, education is an entitlement, I, th I think that is part of the narrative that we need to weave about the huge um, privilege it is to be educated, but that that privilege is based in an entitlement. It is the right of every child to receive an education. And we see that most powerfully in those countries where that right is still not enshrined for every child. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. I am really excited about today's guest. I've been super pumped about this conversation today. I am chatting with Leora Crudders. Leora is the founding chief executive of the Confederation of School Trusts, the national organization and sector body for school trusts in England. And for those outside of England, you might be wondering what a school trust is. And so we'll also get a, uh, a snapshot of that. Welcome, Leora. Thank you so much, Jono. I feel really excited to be here with you today. Yeah, absolutely. First off the bat, tell us a little bit about what you do. And like I said, if you don't mind, we do have an international audience. Um, can you just explain what a school trust is for those who aren't familiar? Of course. So uh, I founded the Confederation of School Trusts nearly six years ago now. Um, and I, I made the decision to create the organization I now lead because we were at the early stages of the journey in England around Academy Trusts. Now, an Academy Trust is an independent legal entity that runs schools. So it's independent of uh, a local authority um, and it exists outside of, of local authority control. So there are some other uh, jurisdictions and countries who organize their school system in similar ways. Uh, so. Uh, for example, in the Netherlands, there are groups of schools which are not in municipal control or not in government control that are their own legal entities that run schools. So essentially, that's what a school trust is. And the organisation I lead represents school trusts and speaks on their behalf at national level to government, to policymakers, to regulators, to senior civil servants. Yeah, amazing. I can see you have explained that before <laughs> once or twice. That was extremely Indeed. articulate for something that I know for me, I'll have to listen, listen back to that because when I'm chatting with school leaders outside of the UK, I don't know if I do a, um, I'm not usually as eloquent with my explanation. So I'll have to listen back to that, Leora. Um, yeah, really excited to hear some of your story and to share that with our listeners as a starting point. I'd love to hear any moments that come to mind from your childhood that might have shaped you to become the person, but also the leader you are today. What comes to mind? So, Jono, I'm going to share quite a personal story, I think. So I was born and educated in apartheid South Africa, and there's a whole story there, but I don't think that's the story of this interview. So I started my teaching career. I'm an English teacher in um, what was then referred to as the township of Alexandra, in a school which ran from a community hall funded by non-governmental organisations because, um, as our listeners might know, uh, the apartheid education system is a two-tier education system and the education of black children in, in South Africa uh, was neither free nor compulsory for a long period of time. So this, this was a school that existed outside of the government structure, funded by non-governmental organisations. And I learned so much from working in that community. I learned of their anger and their struggle. I learned about the grinding poverty of their daily lives and their absolute belief in education. I also learned of their huge cultural wealth. So this was the place where the poet Mangani Wali Siroti and um, the writer Mark Matabani grew up. It was also the place where a young Nelson Mandela rented a room where, when he first came to Johannesburg in 1941. So my professional self, my professional self as a teacher, and most of what I believe about education now, most of what I believe about leadership and about social justice was forged in these early years. Yeah, absolutely. And I can see why that would be uh, the case, what an amazing place to have your first experiences. Um, are there any 
you know, I love to ask leaders about aha moments from that season. Do you remember any particular aha moments you had as a leader or even as a teacher? We do have a lot of educators listening. And, and so, um, yeah, any of those moments that you reflect on and think, oh, that was the first time I realized that was true or not to do that ever again or anything like that? So I think uh, the importance of humility in leadership was something that those early years of being a teacher taught me um, that also came from a very early experience at school, actually. But working in that community was an incredible privilege, but it was also an incredibly humbling experience because the drive of that community towards educating their children was huge amidst all the obstacles everything that they faced, um, including obviously the apartheid government, but but also, as I refer to, the grinding poverty, the lack of access uh, to schools. And yet there was still this huge commitment to education as a force for social justice uh, in, in the community. Can I ask a silly question? Uh, do you Did you see that drive? Did that come from a... Uh, I hear that and I assume that there was a sense that education was part of the answer to lift the next generation out of poverty. Is that where it came from or is there more to the picture than I'm seeing? Oh, so I think there's so much more to the picture. That that certainly is true. So there was certainly a view uh, that education and schooling w- was was a way to, to lift children out of poverty. And I should say as well um, that I believe passionately in a difference between social justice and social mobility. Uh, And that also came from these early years. So for me, social mobility is the lifting of a few, the lifting up of a few. Social justice is the lifting up of all. And one of the things that that the teaching in that community taught me was the importance of mobilising education as as a force for social justice. So education should be about lifting up all children, not just lifting up a, a few children. But certainly in that community, there was a very, very strong commitment to seeing schooling and education um, as a as a way as a way out of poverty, but also as a way of bringing about a change to those very unequal social conditions of the apartheid years. Yeah, that's incredible, and that's why I've found that. I think for me, not being an educator, but now working with so many educators, a lot of this, and this links to the next question I want to ask you, which is a bit off script, but it um, it definitely pops into my head. But I look at myself as someone who took my own education for granted and who I really didn't understand the significance of education in terms of how we're talking about it now until I started working with passionate educators. And I feel like I caught it, you know, I, I, it being around them, it was like, I I get it now, but I didn't get it in Australia all these years growing up. I really did take it for granted. So I want to ask you, um, (laughs) this is a massive, probably unanswerable question, but I'm interested in your insight. How do we, how do we change the narrative in education in places like Australia where I am so that the John O. Whites, when they're growing up, you know, when, when I'm in high school, what what do you think it is in our society that is undervaluing education? Why does someone like me end up not really catching the significance of that, whereas you're describing a community that seemed to really get the significance of education? Like I said, big unanswerable question, but what, what are your thoughts on that, Leora? Yeah, so I, I think it is an unanswerable question. It is something I've pondered for many years. Uh, it was particularly acute when I moved to England um, as a young teacher, I I did struggle to understand the complacency around education because I'd come from a country and a community who had fought for the right to an education. And, you know, one of the most powerful stories I think I can tell you is that there were children uh, in South Africa who died for the right to an education. So that's how important that education was in or was perceived to be in, in South Africa. Um, There are many countries in the world, um, sadly, still, where education is not an entitlement. It is not a right. And obviously we're seeing that um, in Afghanistan at the moment, where girls are being denied the right to uh, an education. So so this idea that uh, education is an entitlement, I I think that is part of the narrative that we need to weave about the huge uh, privilege it is to be educated 
but that that privilege is based in an entitlement. It is the right of every child to receive an education. And we see that most powerfully in those countries where that right is still not enshrined for every child. Yeah, well said. And I'm interested to know, you, I, I imagine you, you speak with and, uh, and work with um, people involved in policy, but at the same time, your trust, um, your association members are on the front line running, you know, running these schools. Um, from a policy level, what is it that you mentioned the difference between social mobility and social justice? I love that. I hadn't, um, I haven't heard of that distinction put it like uh, put that way before. From a policy perspective, a leadership perspective, how do we lead in education towards social justice? rather than social mobility and particularly i'm interested to know what are the what are the kind of um counterintuitive things are the things where you think oh yeah that would be great but actually if we're not careful we end up moving towards social mobility rather than social justice so i think the 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 first is that entitlement that right to to a, a great education for all children and young people we really have to say that and mean that uh, and that that essentially is the comprehensive principle that every child should have the right to a good education. Secondly, I think there's something ab- about uh, the curriculum. Um, I believe, probably because of my experiences, early experiences in South Africa, that every child has the right to what I would refer to as a knowledge rich curriculum and that is because knowledge is the entitlement of all it's not the entitlement of a few people who have access to power and I believe that very very passionately so if we were to pursue education as a force for social justice and if we were to mobilize education as a force for social justice we would uh, we would we would implement the comprehensive principle so every child has the right to a good education but we we would also think Um, in profoundly different ways than I think perhaps we think at the moment about what what kind of curriculum experience we want for every child and making that powerful knowledge available uh, to every child. Okay, I have to ask because you you mentioned it and so now you've um, you've got my brain thinking that way I'm sure listeners are the same you you said there um, profoundly you know some profound differences to how we're currently doing it uh, what are the what are the biggest areas around curriculum that you see um, that could need to be profoundly different for that to be achieved? Yeah, so this is what I'm going to say now is potentially uh, controversial because there are countries and jurisdictions um, all over the world that have pursued a curriculum which is different from the one that I'm proposing. So a curriculum that is informed by the idea that there are some immutable 21st century skills and we might organise our curriculum differently around a set of skills that we want children to acquire. So, for example, the skill of critical thinking or the skill of creativity or the skill of collaboration. So it is not that I don't think these skills are important. In fact, I think they're fundamentally important. But I think the route to these skills is through knowledge. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, As an English teacher, I I think um, I'm able to be uh, creative in in English because it is my subject. And and certainly I can think critically in English because I've been educated in English to expert level. However, I would find it much more difficult to think creatively or to think critically in mathematics because my mathematical knowledge is not good enough. So that route to skill is definitely through knowledge. Uh, And I don't think that across the world today um, that is entirely accepted. And I don't think it's actually accepted in Australia either, unfortunately. And I think what we've seen with the OECD data over years is that those countries and and jurisdictions who do operate knowledge-rich curricula Uh, do much better for all children but much more importantly than that they do much better for those children who are most economically disadvantaged yeah incredible thank you so much for sharing that perspective and i love to hear um controversial 
uh, opinions. You know, one of my favorite questions to ask is what's a commonly held belief in your industry that you disagree with? <laughs> and I think we kind of got one there. That would um, be from it. You. Yes. Yeah, that's it. So you already answered that in advance. Um, one question that comes to my mind, Leora, is um, did you always consider yourself, in terms of doing what you're doing now, do you think you saw yourself doing that when, when you were 10, 15, 20, 25? Or is that something, you know, we talk about imposter syndrome. I feel like every leader says, oh, I deal with some imposter syndrome. And, and I feel like saying to all of them, well, I think everyone does. Um, what about for you? Is that something where becoming the leader you are was something you always saw yourself doing or was there a journey you had to go on to get your head around doing the type of work you're doing now? So there was definitely a journey I had to go on. Um, and I know that lots of people talk about imposter syndrome. Um, I really embrace that part of myself that still very regularly feels like an imposter because I think it keeps me humble. And that importance of humility that I talked about earlier, I think, is is really important as a leader. Otherwise, you you start believing your own hype, and that is really very dangerous. Uh, but I do I do think we need to interrogate that notion of imposter syndrome a little bit, because I think women are more likely to say they feel like imposters than men are. So I'm not sure from that point of view that I want to to embrace that. But I think the importance of humility in leadership is fundamentally important. Yeah, I agree. I love Patrick Lencioni's ideal team player, uh, exactly. where he talks about the three traits and one of them is humility. And I yes. really do think uh, you hit on something really rich there because the more power or the more influence you have as a leader, I think the more control you have over whose voices you listen to. Therefore, if you're, if you're lacking humility, it's very easy to end up, like you said, not only believing your own hype, but you end up creating because of your influence as you get more and more influential, you actually create a echo chamber of hype around you, which is a disservice to you and everyone. And, you know, it sounds bad until it, but then in the real world, that's disastrous when you think about an education system or, um, so I think humility is a great um, kind of antidote for that. So running a membership organization is a huge antidote to that <laughs> because you're constantly exposed <laughs> to people who don't agree with you. Uh, and so you, as, as the leader of a membership organization, I have to so integrate opinions all the time, integrate what people believe to be true or not true about education. So I'm exposed literally on a daily uh, basis to people who think very, very differently about education. And education is a fundam fundamentally contested space. Of course it is. And we wouldn't want it not to be because it's one of the most important parts of human endeavor. So so to keep education contested keeps us thinking, keeps us moving forward. Uh, so the, the poet Blake, who's one of my all-time favorite poets, talks about without contrary is no progression. And it's that contrary that really helps to move the debate forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's there's another level of importance in education as well because that... Um, you know, if you want to develop a culture of learning and the love of learning, it has to start from the leadership team in a school. And so I think that is also another layer where, and the reverse is true, you know, in any organization, not having that curious, not having wanting to be challenged is, is a bad thing. But in a school, particularly if your leadership aren't willing to be learners and to actually do that, then you can set a culture that doesn't embrace the love of learning, which is extremely um, sad for a school and I think is really detrimental. Exactly so. Okay, Leora, we, I mentioned to you before the invitations there, I'd love to do a part two down the track because I've got about 50 questions um, about your journey I haven't asked. But um, so the invitations there, but I, I also want to jump into Leadership Express questions and just ask you a few of these before we wrap up sure. today. Okay, so the first one, this is a question I got from Tim Ferriss. I love this question. What book have you gifted the most to other people? <laughs> so I can say this without any shadow of a doubt. It's The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. Uh, and the Prophet is Gibran's masterpiece. Uh, and he, he writes a series of, of, of treaties um, 
in which the prophet responds to different questions uh, from an audience. Um, and at, at one part uh, in, 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 the, in the beautiful treatise that he writes, a woman who's holding a baby uh, says, says to the prophet, speak to us of children. And the prophet says, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And through they are with you, yet they belong not to you. And at the end of the treatise, he talks about, um, you are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. And I just absolutely love that image of what it means to be a parent, but also what it means to be an educator. So I can't begin to tell you how many people I have gifted the prophet to. <laughs> I love that. And I feel like we're also hearing Leora, the English teacher. <laughs> Yes, in there as well, which I'm, you know, you can never get away from. That's just always part of who you are, um, and I love that beautiful quote. Um, okay, here's one for you. Do you have any favourite questions that you ask? You know, I imagine you're in all different settings. Like you said, you're dealing with members who disagree, which is which is the point. Um, but then you're in a meeting with policymakers, or you're in the meeting with a group of parents in a focus group. And are there any questions you think? Ah, oh, I do ask that question a lot. To you know, in different contexts. How can I help? <laughs> it's a question I often ask. Um, so I think it's a really important and powerful question, but I think it also uh, unlocks something in people because it, 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 it invites people to focus on what they want to happen next, where they think the solutions might lie, where the most fertile, gr fertile ground might be. And so uh, that question, I think, is a question that I, I very often use in my own one-to-ones and in team meetings as well, but used more broadly with, with, with policymakers because it gets us out of thinking about, um, you know, or fighting with each other about what the problem is into uh, territory that is much more constructive. Yeah, I love that. How can I help? It's a great question as well because it gives permission. I think we underestimate the importance and the power of a question like that and how it can give someone that permission to to raise something they were on the fence about, you know, and go, oh, okay, maybe I will run that by, um, by you. I love that. Um, okay, off the top of your head, this might be one you have to think about. Uh, can you think of a great piece of advice you've received at some point? Can be from a previous leader or boss, or it could just be someone in your life who gave you a piece of advice and you thought, yeah, that was that was a really great piece of advice. Yeah, so, so this was a piece of advice that was given to me uh, many years ago, actually, when I... Uh, when I got my first director of education uh, job, um, which was in the London borough of Waltham Forest, um, the advice was keep your balance. And uh, I don't think that I am always able to keep my balance, um, but it, it, the advice works at so many levels. So keep the balance between your life and your work, um, keep the balance of your thought, um, keep keep the balance in terms of your decision making it, it works at many levels at deep levels uh and and it's, it's advice i return to again and again although i don't think i'm very good at following it yeah i like that i like that um that advice and i like the picture of almost like a tightrope as well because i feel like so much of leadership is <laughs> is walking a tightrope in terms of the tension. There's the, there's those tensions you never get away from. And, That's you know, right. the, I like the, I love the book Radical Candor, you know, about the, the being a highly caring, highly challenging leader. And there's two examples of, you know, two sides of a tightrope where you want to control, you know, try to walk that and really be that, um, that critical friend without being uh, letting go and not holding people accountable, but also without um, just being, you know, not caring. Um, okay, last question. I want to come back to something you said earlier, which was around as a as a woman in leadership and education. And I think it, I think it can be true of women in leadership everywhere. It can be more common to have um, or potentially to wrestle with imposter syndrome. And so, I want to ask you if you could only give one piece of advice to a a, a woman in leadership. Let's say in a school. 
um, because I know we might have some women listening who are in middle management or they're, you know, they're head of department or they're a teacher, but they feel the sense of, I really would love to lead people, manage people, and even one day lead a school or do something like Leora. What, what advice would you give them if you could only give them one piece of advice? So I think I'm going to uh, quote from Winnie the Pooh here. Uh, this is Christopher Robin's advice to Winnie the Pooh. He says, you are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. Well, what a beautiful note to, to end on. I, I can't add anything more profound than that. Um, how beautiful to have a lovely Winnie the Pooh quote. Uh, and with a two and a half year old, uh, I'm, I'm fully immersed in all things similar to <laughs> Winnie the Pooh. So. So you're speaking my language with my, um, in terms of my current uh, literary journey that I'm on, um, although it's more spot the dog right now. Um, but um, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. This has been so much fun. I will um, keep you tuned about a part two down the track. Uh, but most of all, I want to say a really big thank you to you, Leora, for coming on, for sharing a bit of your story, uh, for sharing some controversial opinions, which I love about education. And uh, yeah, it's just been a delight. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Jono. It's been lovely to talk to you.